Uh, hi, everyone, and a warm welcome to our human-centric innovation webinar, part of Queen Mary's Breakthrough in AI series. My name is Maria, and I'm Marketing Manager in the Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences. And I'm delighted to be here with you today, joined by two celebrated um, academics, uh, Professor Pat Healy and Dr. Lorenza Yamone. I'm also joined by our host, Biomedical Engineering Final Year student Cameron, who will lead today's discussion. Before we get actually started, I just wanted to quickly run over some housekeeping information. We will be with you today between 45 minutes to an hour, depending on how many questions we get. So if any questions spring to your mind while the session is ongoing, please use the Q&A section of this uh, webinar, and we will respond to the questions during the Q&A portion of the session towards the end. We will try to answer as many questions as possible during the talk. And please also note that this webinar is being recorded, and it will be, and you will be able to view it on demand uh, by yourself or uh, in the uh, future viewers. You will descend the recording by email should you want to access it again. Now I will be handing over to our student host and budding AI expert Cameron to start the talk. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Good afternoon, everyone. Very excited to have you today. So as Maria mentioned, my name is Cameron Young and I'm a final year biomedical engineering student here at Queen Mary. I love learning languages, both lingual and programming based, and thanks to that, I speak English, Spanish, and have experience with Python and C Sharp. I recently started a podcast called Cameron's Lab Dive In to give students insights into the world of STEM. I interview industry professionals just like our guests here today. So without further ado, please allow me to introduce them. So I'll start off with you, Professor Pat Healy. He is our first panelist and a renowned figure in the world of human interaction and cognitive science. He's the head of cognitive science research group here at Queen Mary and a former Turing fellow. He's also now the head of the new Center for, in, for Human-Centered Computing and formerly the senior researcher in residence at the Digital Catapult. His work primarily focuses on human-human interaction and developing technologies for improved communication. Professor Healy's current projects include adaptive learning technologies that can tailor communication in real time, analysis of physical cues for collaborative robotics, and working on new environments for communication and social virtual realities like the metaverse. Our second panelist, Dr. Lorenzo Yamone, is a senior lecturer in robotics at Queen Mary and the director of the CRISP group. CRISP, or Cognitive Robotics and Intelligent Systems for the People, focuses on developing robotics, so developing robots to enhance human life and understand cognition. The focus for the robots is to use their hands intelligently as humans do. As a Turing Fellow, his research is, is rooted in cognitive robotics, aiming to create intelligent robots inspired by human cognition. His work covers various areas, including dexterous manipulation, visual haptic perception, and human-robot interaction, with the ultimate goal of integrating robots effectively into human society. Now, if that's not exciting to you guys, I don't know what will be. So I'm very excited to speak with you both today. Thank you for joining us. Um, so I'll just get off and get started with you, Dr. Lorenzo. So I wanted to ask if you could give us a brief overview of what's the difference between cognitive robotics and traditional robotics. Yeah, uh, thank you, Cameron, for uh, the introduction. Hi, everybody. Pleasure to be here. Um, right, so cognitive robotics, uh, which is uh, my main area of research and is also one of the modules that I teach here at uh, Queen Mary. Uh, this is how I define it, is this, um, let's say, this science, this discipline that has two objectives. One objective is to take inspiration from uh, biology and looking at uh, human intelligence and animal intelligence and take inspiration from that to create better robotic systems. Uh, robots that can help us in our everyday life, in industry, in Azardo's environment, uh, anywhere where we want to have robots that are more intelligent. But at the same time, using robotic technologies and computational modeling to better understand human intelligence. So somehow to be able to create this loop where the disciplines, the cognitive science disciplines like psychology, neuroscience, cognitive science, they can create inspiration for robotics, but then robotics can also contribute to better understand uh, human intelligence and the human brain. 
And uh, this is the main philosophy behind uh, behind cognitive robotics, which I think it's uh, it's very exciting. At least it's very exciting for me. I agree. And speaking of this loop between understanding human communication and also understanding robotics, how would you say that understanding our um, cognition contributes to the advancement in such robotics? Yeah, so, um, well, you, ask, you also asked me first, like, uh, what is the difference between cognitive robotics and traditional robotics? So in general, the objective of robotics will always to create robots, create machines that, that, they, that they can do work for us, basically. Things that we don't want to do, things that are boring for us, uh, things that are dangerous for us to do. We want to create machines that, that will do those things and that they will help us to do those things better, right? That's the main objective of robotics in general. Uh, now, traditionally robotics, uh, the, the way it has been included in our society was to um, basically, so mostly it was in factories and in environments that we call uh, structured environments. So environments that somehow are made easier so that the robot could do things there. For example, if you have to uh, create like, you know, to manufacture a car and you have to manipulate all the different parts of the car in a factory, you will put those parts uh, on very on precise positions and you will know everything about those different parts. And then after you know that you write mathematical models and computer programs and the robot will execute the same action over and over. For example, picking a car part of the car in one place and putting it somewhere else. And this is like the repetition of a very uh, simple kind of action, right? And for that, the robotics has been great in the past, uh, you know, 60 years and a lot of uh, uh, useful uses. Now, when you want to uh, bring those technologies in environment that are less structured, so for example, imagine um, a kitchen, uh, whatever kitchen where you want to cook some food or uh, uh, an hospital where you have patients uh, uh, there, or uh, you know uh, uh, a field where you are uh, harvesting uh, uh, fruits or vegetables, right? So any environment which is a bit more unstructured, where you cannot precisely define where things are because things change and move around, and there are people as well, then it becomes much more difficult to put robots there. We still don't have the technology that will enable us to have autonomous robots that are able to understand the situation and do things over there, and so. Intelligent robots or cognitive robots uh, have the potential to have more uh, autonomy and to be able to interact in those situations. And that's why we take inspiration from humans, because that's the best examples we have of uh, agents that are able to do these things um, in, in this type of environment. And so from, let's say, one main objective in that sense is to take inspiration from our intelligence and our autonomy, our perception, uh, to create these things in robots so that they can operate in those environments. Uh, and then there is an additional uh, aspect, which is if you have uh, uh, robots that will do things in a way that is somehow similar to the way in which humans do things, it will be easier for humans to cooperate with such robots because it will be easier for humans to understand and predict what the robot is going to do in different situations and this could be you know when we collaborate with uh, with other people like human human collaboration communication we always have expectation of what the other person is going to do how he's going to do it uh, uh, how the body movements will prompt a certain action or a certain behavior right and so somehow if we can have a robots that behave in a similar way then it will be easier for humans to cooperate with this type of robots so that's at least another uh, aspect or another perspective to see why taking inspiration from humans to make robots can be beneficial for having robots that help us in our daily activities. I think that's very fascinating. And it also links into your own research, Professor Healy, because you're also doing cognitive robotics. So could you talk to us a little bit about how you've noticed that there's a difference between the way that people interact with each other versus how the robots maybe interact with each other or interact with humans? What have you noticed between those kind of interactions? Well, it's, it's, yeah, it's really interesting. So it's usually an interesting problem that it sets you when you try to think about how you would build something to do even something quite simple, like handing a pen to someone. Mm. So it seems kind of straightforward, 
until you try to engineer a system to do it. And then you find that actually there's a really complicated set of cues and interdependencies when human beings hand over a pen. So there'll be moments of eye contact. There'll be points at which as the pen is moving, the hand moves to grab it. The hand shape itself tells you something about what they're going to do, where, you know, whether they're going to pull it up or put it down. Um, also, there's the kind of joint, uh, something Lorenzo thinks about quite a lot, really, the pressure, how you sense the degree of pressure when somebody's going to let go. And then perhaps you'll do something like smile afterwards to, to show that you've completed the task. Uh, robots, um, think, you know, thinking about getting a robot to do that makes you look very closely at what people are actually doing. And then you have to think about what kinds of sensors you need, what kinds of force sensors, what kinds of uh, ways of communicating things like task uh, initiation, task completion, all of those cues that we find very, you know, it's transparent, so we don't think about it. Uh, but actually there's very fine-grained um, coordination going. Yeah. Sounds like a lot of like subtle communication cues that you have to pay attention to as well. And speaking of which, I actually, when I was speaking with you previously on email, Dr. Professor Healy, you mentioned about making robots blush, which I would very much like to learn a little bit more about. And I feel like people might find that interesting. So would yeah, you mind so explaining this, what you meant by that? This is work um, with uh, Simi Park on a PhD recently. Um, Lorenzo was helping with that as well. The, um, so the point was really to think about the fact that robots really, you know, although we have these uh, exciting images of humanoid robots that can interact and walk around and so on, they're not really anywhere near uh, being competent at those tasks at the moment. And maybe they never will. I mean, it's possible that there will never be the dry, you know, enough reasons to build what would be a very expensive and very difficult to engineer robot that could actually mimic a human. So you, you maybe you're faced with the fact that you won't always perform properly. Well, if you think about that, neither do people. And what people do when things go wrong, one of the things they do is they blush. And blushing is really interesting, right? Because it, it shows that you recognize that you've done something wrong or, you know, failed to, failed to do the right thing in a certain circumstance. But it also elicits sympathy. So you, you know, I don't know, you spill a cup of coffee, you apologize, you blush slightly, and then uh, people will typically will normally help you, tie, you know, clean up all and that's a really interesting proposition for robotics, because one of the things you might want to do is get people to help train a robot in situ, doing tasks around, you know, your quite complicated kitchen environment, where all sorts of things are very strange and in strange places, and, you know, there's a lot of learning to do. And if you can enlist the people who are using the robot to help you train the robot, that's really quite a positive thing. So we just got very interested in, you know, how could we use this? Could we, could we think about ways in which a robot could blush to signal that it recognizes it's done something uh, incorrectly and then elicit the help of other people uh, in, in uh, putting that right? And that's kind of, you know, when people think about robot facial expressions, they normally think about things like smiles or, or, or you know, nods. But this is a different you know, a really different class of expressions, blushing and, and embarrassment. Yeah. I think that does kind of lead into what I wanted to ask you a little bit later, Dr. Lorenzo, so about the just like little subtle things that can make us a little bit more emotional, I guess, towards the robot, having that different like human connection that we would have with each other, getting people to have it with robots. So I would want, I want to ask a little bit more about things like, for example, tactile sensing. So when you're able to, just, I guess, when the robot can tell what it's holding or what it's what it's seeing in that kind of way. How would you link that into your robotics? And also, why do you think that's so important? Yeah, I mean, one of the um, one of the uh, the aspect that we deal with in our in our research group, uh, maybe the kind of central aspect, central research uh, question we deal with, uh, I call it the intelligence of the hands. Mm -hmm. I think in general, like our hands, they're they're so intelligent and. If you look at uh, our brain, there is a large portion of our brain which is dedicated to uh, receiving inf information, sensory information from our hands and controlling the movement of our hands. A very large portion of our brain is fully dedicated to that. 
and uh, and it, it makes sense because I mean that's the main way we interact with the outside world. We do things with objects all of the time, so uh, our brain is fully dedicated to that. Uh, so it's a very interesting topic to study, especially because then when you try to do those things in a robot, you understand that. I, I made example before the difference between a very structured environment, the industrial environment, and any other environment. If you want to simply pick an object, it's very easy to do it in a very structured environment where you know exactly where the object is and you know exactly that the object is going to be rigid, for example. But if you have to pick a strawberry from a plant, then you know it's you don't know exactly what the uh, stiffness of that strawberry is gonna be. You don't know exactly where it is, uh, etc. So it becomes much more complex. And when you try to do it with a robot, you realize that it's so difficult. For us, it's so easy. It doesn't ma it doesn't mean that it's actually easy. <laughs> it's easy because our brain is using a lot of energy of and computation to do those things. Um, so it's a very interesting problem to study and. A big component of that is the sense of touch, of course, which, uh, which, which, of course, we have it in, in humans, we have it on our hands, and it's very important to manipulate objects and to gather information about objects. If you want to know if something is hard or soft, you will squeeze it and you will use your movements in combination with your tactile sense. But then we have the sense of touch is, uh, is on all our skin, right? It covers our uh, entire body. And so, um, and so, for example, we use it also a lot to, to communicate things to people. I mean, physical touch is a very important way in which we, uh, we communicate uh, with people, we interact with the people. Uh, and I mean, uh, we, we know all very well, we passed through a few years in which uh, uh, during COVID, uh, uh, during the worst times of COVID, it was uh, very difficult for us to have this physical connection and everybody missed it terribly, right? So. And there are also a lot of studies that show how that affected many people in uh, in stronger ways, right? So, so of course, if we could have uh, also robots that not only have uh, sensors, tactile sensor in their hands, but also on the rest of the body, and there are some uh, people working on that, uh, we could have uh, another way for for robot to interact. Uh, uh, physically and socially with people so that uh, that can be a very interesting additional modalities i was watching just the other day uh, a video uh, and an interview from colleagues of mine in italy that they're working with this uh, uh, cute humanoid robot that is that is covered with tactile sensors and they were showing uh, like a demonstration in which person was touching the arm of the robot and kind of caressing the robot and the robot smiling in response uh, and that was just the demonstration, but it could prompt to, you know, applications, for example, in uh, elderly care, healthcare, uh, or uh, where, you know, you can, you want to have a companion robot that is, uh, uh, that somehow uh, alleviates some of the, um, some of the work that people have to do to, to care about, uh, about pe other people. And that is needed a lot. And I mean, we know, for example, just from the example of NHS in the UK, but any health system in the world is facing problems with the lack of, uh, of, of people that can do this type of jobs. And so to have machines that can provide not only physical help, but also this kind of social uh, of social help, it's, uh, it's, very, uh, it's very useful. It's very interesting. There is also another example in Japan. Since many years now, this uh, robot in the shape of a, a seal, uh, like animal and that you can pet basically it's a it's a robot pet and they used it a lot in um, in healthcare and also for example in uh, uh, with um, um, children with uh, different stages of um, uh, um, autism spectrum disorders um, and uh, it shows that it's really beneficial for uh, for many for many of these healthcare situations so so yeah there are many examples and quite exciting I think yeah, I agree. Very good. It's, I think it's really cool to think of the fact that, you know, we're training robots to be able to better take care of us later on. And I think that's really, that's really interesting as well. Um, but from what you both have been saying, it kind of sounds like, you know, like you're raising a robot in a way, like almost like, like raising a child, so just teaching them little things, that's learning how they learn. Um, could you talk maybe a little bit more about how you teach a robot to learn in that way? Maybe Professor Healy, if you wouldn't mind explaining a little bit more. Like when you're teaching a robot to learn, what kind of systems would you employ? And if I know that's really a broad question, but if you could talk about it in a high level way, I would be really happy. No, no, I think it's just a question for Lorenzo, really. Oh. <laughs> He's much more expert than I am on, on uh, robot learning. Yeah, I mean, there, there are so many, there are many ways in which you can do it. Uh, 
So let's say maybe two major ways are, one is kind of autonomous learning. So the idea that the robot, similarly to what a baby does, it will start to explore and touch the objects and look around and with time develop the uh, connection between what you are doing and what you're seeing, what you're touching and what you're doing, and then building these internal models that will enable you to later on uh, do things that will generate those uh, sensory perceptions that you are waiting for, right? So if I want to tap and if I want to generate the movement of an object, I know that if I tap it, the object will move, right? And uh, but then there are other ways. I mean, in fact, there are all these different ways are different ways in which uh, kids learn. Like uh, kids, they learn by themselves. So if you put a uh, young young kid in a in a room full of toys, they will start playing around and you know moving things around and learning. But they will also imitate, right? They will imitate the parents, the uh, other peers, the friends. They will look at what they are doing and try to imitate. And then that is done in robotics. There is a big field of imitation learning, so robots learning from looking at humans. And uh, and 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 then there are and there is another way which is. Uh, uh, it doesn't really exist much in the human domain, but it's very useful in uh, in robots. Is that you can uh, use a technique called the teleoperation. Teleoperation is where you basically a human user will use some kind of device to move a, a remote robot. So you have a robot somewhere else, and the person is in another location, and they can use a device that could be a joystick or a controller, or it can be another small robot that you move. And the movements you do are replicated by the other robot. And so in, in that way, you can teach a robot how to do certain things. Uh, and so these are some of the techniques that uh, that we use. Yeah, that sounds really cool, especially the, the tele-operating side of it. It kind of reminds me of telesurgery from a biomedical engineering student. I had to bring it up at least once. <laughs> um, but I also wanted to ask you, Professor Healy, back to the communication side. Um, one of the papers that you did was titled Human-Like Communication, and it was based on the challenge set by Alan Turing at about 1950, I want to say. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask if you've seen um, since then, has the technology changed and do you think it's still a challenge for us to make robots have this kind of human-like communication? I know you mentioned that it, it might be kind of far off, but I wanted to ask if you could expand on that a little bit more. Yeah, I, I think it is still quite far off. I, I don't think there's any reason why it couldn't ever get there. It's just, I think the challenge is quite, it's quite a lot bigger than people think. So um, that one example I came across recently in work by um, some people in Holland, Honka and Holla, but they were looking at blinks. Uh, you know, blinks are one of the, it's one of the most rapid movements you can make. It's just a few hundred milliseconds. And it turns out in conversation, they're a systematic cue. So if somebody blinks quickly, they're kind of encouraging you to keep talking. It's like positive feedback. But if they blink for a bit longer, you interpret it, not consciously, you just automatically interpret it as a, as a sign you should say less. So, so there's this tiny little cue <laughs> that, you know, people have not really thought about very carefully. It's all about the pragmatics of the communication song. Uh, and we're just very far from engineering those kinds of um, abilities into robots. Of course you could, but I think, you know, there's two sides to this. One is that we don't yet really fully understand enough about how human communication works. It's like a very complicated dance that we're doing all the time. There's a lot more work on verbal than there is on nonverbal communication, although there is a lot on nonverbal, but, you know, we're still really discovering very basic things. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think it's quite far off. And I think I think one of the things we need to do is, is really exploit the social science much more effectively as a, as a, a way of informing uh, robot development. I agree. It's more of an interdis interdisciplinary approach. That, that sounds really exciting as well. Um, but could I also reach out, uh, sorry, <laughs> could I also ask a little bit more about the digital side of things? So taking the, the things that you're learning from robotics into more of a social virtual reality. So like you mentioned the metaverse as well. So could you talk about how your research maybe applies to the more digital kind of side as well? Yeah, so uh, so the, re the really big advances in AI <laughs> have happened mainly because that we've had a lot of text data available. Mm -hmm. 
So, you know, the amount of language in, in, in texts that you can access and then learn from has just exploded exponentially. But it's really obvious that the thing about robotics and thinking about human communication is it's embodied. Mm. And that kind of, uh, the access to that hasn't been there. We don't have huge data sets of people interacting. We've got some videos, you know, there are some videos and stuff, but we don't have lots of it. But that's all going to change. So the 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 way that the um, the way that social virtual reality and the metaverse is developing, because you've got a headset on and maybe gloves or some kind of motion detector, all of your nonverbal communication is immediately available as data, and that's just a situation we haven't been in before. Um, so you know, I would expect there'll be another big step up in the. Um, the ability of AI to deal with all of that non-verbal stuff. And it's quite interesting to think about the Turing test, actually, because the, the Turing test, when it, when it was devised, it was just, it was essentially typing text messages <laughs> and then waiting for a text message to come back and then typing another one. So it's strictly alternating text-only interaction. And that's the sort of, I think that test has been passed in some ways, um, by some machines, but in general, that's not really how we communicate. We do something very much more multimodal, uh, you know, hands and faces and eyes move all the time, not just the speakers. Um, like as I'm speaking, I can see that you're giving me little nods or smiles or whatever as, as feedback. All of that's really important to the way I talk. Um, you know, that fe I need to get the real time feedback to be able to respond appropriately and we interrupt each other as well yeah exactly <laughs> yes <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of so, like uh, it's like yeah, so we just we're all kind of quiet like for the the online meetings and things with the camera on versus the camera off so it's definitely <laughs> 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 yeah. having that kind of feedback is important <laughs> yeah so you know we're just i think we just haven't we're just on the edge of all of that really uh but the, but the data is going to be available and there's you know that's just a big opportunity. Yeah. And then speaking of like more physical cues, so like you mentioned, Pepper, the, the, the feedback that you get from people smiling at you or people just kind of interacting with you non-verbally, um, does that also link to more haptic feedback as well? So Dr. Renzo, I could bring you in about um, some of your research is on visual haptic perception. I wanted to ask if you wouldn't mind explaining, first of all, what that is for those of us that may not know, and then how that kind of links into your, re your research into cognitive robotics. Yeah, uh, yeah. Haptics. Uh, there are a couple of maybe some different definitions around, but typically by haptic we consider the combination of uh, uh, tactile and movements. Uh, so um, anytime uh, in in our own sensations where we combine touch and movements, we talk about haptics. Then uh, in uh, in the technology fields, a lot of times when we talk about hap haptics, we we talk about haptic feedback, which is, let's say, how a, a human person can receive some stimulation, for example, on the hands, that will uh, render some tactile stimuli. So, for example, the example of tactile of haptic feedback could be uh, I am uh, interacting with some virtual reality, and in the virtual reality, I'm touching an object. So the, the avatar is touching an object. Uh, and the physical person on the other side, they will feel that on their own skin, right? So that's what we call haptic feedback. And uh, for robotics, that's uh, very important uh, uh, for, for what I mentioned earlier, which is teleoperation. So uh, if you think of interacting with a virtual uh, avatar, uh, but uh, it's quite similar to interacting with a remote robot, right? So basically in teleoperation, we, uh, we move uh, a remote robot and it would be, and it's very useful if when the remote robot touches something you operate or you feel it right mm -hmm. you can feel it as a, a force acting on your hand for example that kind of blocks your movement in one direction if the robot is hitting a wall for example uh, or you can feel it in on your fingertips or on your fingers on your skin if the robot is touches something you have that uh, feeling back um some some of the experiments that we have done in that sense they show that um uh, if you so 
And another other source of information, of course, is visual feedback. You can look at the, let's say the robot may have a camera and you may look at that video feed to get a feeling of what is the robot doing. And typically the visual feedback is very useful to do many things. If you have the visual feedback and you don't have this haptic feedback, in many cases, you are still able to do things with a remote robot, but it's much more tiring for, for the human operator. It's less natural and it's uh, you have uh, to use a lot more of a kind of mental effort. It, 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 you get exhausted after, you know, 20 minutes of doing things. While on the other hand, if you have this haptic feedback, things become uh, much more natural and therefore easier to do, especially if you're going to do it for, for a long time. Um, which in fact is then the same thing that we see in um, experiments that are done on people uh, on the importance of the sense of touch when we manipulate objects. There are some old experiments uh, that they anesthetize the fingertips of, uh, of people uh, to, to remove the sense of touch, basically, temporarily. And, and, and this, there is one famous task of a person trying to light a match mm. with the fingers anesthetized. And they can do it only by using vision without the sense of touch but it takes like ages. <laughs> so you can see this video of this person like really struggling to pick up the match and to apply the correct amount of force to, you know, to, to light it up. They do it, but it takes 10 minutes or something, right? Something that they will do in one second, right? So, uh, so it shows how, how important the sense of touch is directly when we do things, but also uh, as haptic feedback when we interact with something remote. And of course, I mentioned this teleoperation, which for robotics is very is very important. But similar thing happen when you if you interact with the virtual reality, right? And then uh, the other aspect which is interesting, uh, people I think now are start talking about uh, tactile internet. Uh, so the idea that you can uh, so typically we interact with the internet, for example, mainly through visual feedback, right? You go on a web page, uh, you scroll, imagine the catalog of uh, I don't know, an online supermarket and you want to buy some fruits or some vegetables and you look at them, right? Or you want to buy clothes and you look at them. What if you can actually touch them remotely, right? So similar technologies can be used for that, that, uh, you know, you interact with the web pages where you have different type of, uh, you know, clothes, fabrics, shoes, bags, whatever you want to buy. And you cannot... You can see them, but you can also touch them and feel uh, the texture, for example. How, how does this uh, T-shirt feel? Or, uh, you know, is this uh, mango ripe or not? <laughs> Otherwise, I won't buy. Right? So, I mean, so this is like uh, um, still a bit futuristic, but, you know, this is the type of technologies that depending on uh, uh, different uh, reason and uh, whether there's going to be you know investments or or not uh, it could become a reality relatively relatively soon at least in uh, in some context no in fact just like i just want to follow up about the social touch stuff as well because it's so important so the the um the sense of touch can it can f comfort people reduce their stress levels make them feel less socially excluded it has to be specifically soft touch actually. Mm -hmm. There's two kinds of touch that we detect. Um, and the, I think the most striking example is the experiments done on the uh, brain responses to pain. Um, and the, if you're holding hands with uh, a friend or a partner, just holding hands, the brain response to pain stimulus is, is uh, substantially reduced. So it actually, it actually can mitigate physical pain, just sort of illustrates the strength of the effects. Yeah. I think I hadn't really thought of how just that sense of touch also helps with, like you mentioned, this like little make pain management as well. It's, it's really interesting to learn how, like how we communicate in that, that sense of touch really, it all links together. It's very interdisciplinary, as you both mentioned. Um, just for students that are more interested in the cross interdisciplinary approach of your work, could you suggest ways that they could maybe get involved in this research into like linguistics, cognitive, and this like haptic feedback, how do they get involved in that, especially at Queen Mary, if you would mind explaining a little bit more? Uh, yeah, can I, can I jump in? So, I mean, <laughs> for what, for what I can uh, say, for example, well, I mean, Queen Mary uh, offers different master programs uh, 
the, 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 the two I can mention now is a master in AI and a master in robotics. So advanced robotics uh, probably will change name into master robotics and AI because that's in fact what we offer. Uh, and students who are joining those uh, courses, they those programs, they uh, well, they have different modules. Uh, I mentioned one, which is cognitive robotics, the one I teach, and uh, I definitely give a lot of these examples of uh, how to use. Uh, uh, so it's really a multidisciplinary module where I give example from uh, psychology to robotics and the connection of it. In fact, for example, within that module, uh, half of the module is about the students doing a small individual project where they take a specific idea from psychology about some human behaviors. They, they make a computational model of it that could go into a robot. And so they, they try firsthand how to really take the ideas from psychology, neuroscience and implement them in a robot so that we can achieve ideally those two objectives that I mentioned in the beginning, having robots that are more useful really for us but also use that as a tool to understand more. So to kind of prove maybe some of the theories from psychology, because if you get a theory from psychology of the way in which we communicate or the way in which we manipulate objects, whatever, and then you implement that in a robot and you try it out, then I'm simplifying a bit, but if it works on the robot, you can say, oh, okay, so maybe that, um, that idea from psychology is, is probably true. If you see that the robot behaves in ways that are similar to what is observing human, you can say, oh yeah, maybe this theory actually it's supported by these experiments that we are doing. Or on the other hand, if it doesn't, maybe that will prompt some different studies that they can do in psychology to look at uh, people in another, you know, with another perspective and say, oh, let me try this other experiment in psychology or neuroscience to verify whether this is actually what's happening, or maybe it's a little bit different, right? And so we, we give students the chance in a limited, uh, you know, uh, scope, but to, to understand what this process could be. Uh, and then on top of that, they, they have actually um, an extended research project, which is 50% of their time overall over the year. And that could be in robotics, it could be in AI, it could be in combination with the computer vision, with the natural language processing, uh, uh, all of the other uh, things that our researchers do in uh, uh, in the departments. Yeah, that, that also comes back to the loop that you both mentioned before of like looking at how humans interact and then applying that to the robots and then applying what the robots do back to the humans. Yeah. So definitely a, a nice little loop to come back to. Um, Professor Healer, I'm going to bring you back in. So I would like to ask a little bit more about your one of your most recent publications. It was called um, Power and Vulnerability, Managing Sensitive Language in Organizational Communication. So just speaking about how the different the different types of communication we've been talking about, um, I wanted to ask if it's more like what kind of um, things you've noticed about how, for example, positions of power and how they affect the use of language in workplace communication. If you could talk more about that, I think that links to AI as well. Yeah, it, it, it does. So the, uh, the, the basic uh, finding from that paper is that the in a very big organization, big engineering organization, if you look at the emails that the managers write and the emails that the members of the groups that they uh, manage are in, you see this very clear difference in the use of any kind of sensitive words. So words that might refer to uh, ethnicity or religion or, or politics, they're, they're a much lower um, usage. And that seems to be very much about the role they're in. So mm -hmm. the fact that they are, you know, their emails are going to multiple people, that they uh, might ultimately be held to account. I mean, I keep thinking about um, the recent uh, revelations of, of the COVID inquiry where... <laughs> People had their emails and their text messages uh, scrutinized in, in a level of detail that they probably never imagined would happen. <laughs> and I think it's that kind of thing that, you know, uh, people in, in more powerful positions, although there is a stereotype that they tend to be less inhibited and, and might, you know, say just speak uh, uh, inappropriately more often, actually it's the other way around. That, that because these people are more vulnerable, to criticism, they use potentially sensitive language less. And how do you think that that would apply to robotics? Just like as they're as we build up that communication for robots, do you think that there will eventually be 
I guess, the hierarchy in the way that robots speak as well? I, I think what it points to is the fact that we've got to be really sensitive to context. Mm. So I swear most often with my closest friends, right? And it, and it's not really abusive. I mean, it, you know, it's, it's like it's a joke and it's friendly and it shows that we're all aligned and affiliated with each other. But I would just wouldn't speak the same way in an email. I just wouldn't, right? And I think that's being really clever about understanding what those contexts are and what's appropriate in some and not in others is a really interesting challenge for AI because language models tend to be, you know, very big, very generic. <laughs> they don't really uh, discriminate who they're talking to or what the situation is. So I think that, you know, that's a very interesting challenge. And then just a little bit of a question on the other hand. So one of the things that a lot of people notice when they're speaking with different AI or just at least working with different AI models is this implementation of things like bias, for example. So how would, I guess, you deal with that when you're dealing with communication for robotics? I know a lot of it is like nonverbal, but how do you deal with the implementation of bias, for example, into your models? Hopefully there isn't it, but you know, some things can be. Is yeah. that for me or for Lorenzo? Um, I'm going to speak with you because you're already there. But Dr. Lorenzo, feel free to jump in if I'm you have any thoughts as well. This is a really big issue in AI, obviously. Uh, there's bias in the data. It learns from the data, and therefore it's kind of holding a mirror up to us and all our biases. Um, I, I think there's a really interesting issue here, which is that we, we kind of often only discover ourselves that we're biased when we actually say something to someone, <laughs> and then they challenge it or they, they talk back to us. And actually... For me, that's the thing we need to understand and build in to the AI systems. I don't think it's possible to always anticipate every possible bias. Um, that you know, they're, they're just there. I think the, the thing that we need to do is create systems that make it possible to be challenged and learn from the challenge and then adapt as a result. And, and we just don't have that cycle in the current generation of uh, dialogue systems or AIs, language AIs. I just found that interesting, so I thought I would ask. Um, one more question for you. Well, not one more. There's plenty of time. <laughs> Dr. Renz, I wanted to ask you back to your own research. For example, um, the QMQ project, which is focused on human in, you know, hand interaction forces. I wanted to ask about going back to that tactile sensing, what potential does QMQ have for advancing in that field? Yeah, so uh, yeah, so this is a, I like this project because it also shows another way in which uh, uh, we can use technologies that it's, uh, let's say, initially developed for robotics, but then we can use it for more uh, cognitive science or human human studies, right? Because mm -hmm. so I mentioned uh, uh, this uh, the use of tactile sensors for robots, so that the robot you put tactile sensor on the hand of a robot, and the robot can understand. Uh, properties of objects and you can manipulate objects better. I can manipulate delicate objects uh, to apply applying the right amount of force, right? And we have worked for many years uh, developing these sensors for the robot. But then we thought, okay, can we put, can we use this sensor for another uh, objective? And we created this uh, cube, which is completely covered with these tactile sensors. And then we, um, so basically it's, it's a cube, not this shape, but um, so basically it's completely covered with tactile sensor. So when you when you take it, this object, we can measure what are the forces that you apply, where do you put your fingers, etc. So we can use that as a device, as a device to to study and understand the human manipulation in different settings. So it's again a way to use the technology that was initially developed for robotics to actually do human studies, and. Uh, and then the human studies, uh, again, could be something that is directed towards a better understanding of how humans work, but also they could possibly inform how to create better robotic hands or better controllers for the robotic hands we have. Uh, so there is, again, this double objective of advancing technology, but also our uh, deep understanding of, of humans. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are now using the cube for... Uh, I mean, I, initially, I think also with Pat, we, we discussed, I mean, Pat made example before of the uh, 
let's say how sophisticated it is to to pass a pen to somebody else right this simple we call handover uh, task that are so natural for us but in fact there are so many uh, subtle aspects of that that uh, uh, that we could analyze and one is uh, you know how do we balance the forces from my hand to your hand uh, so that we make sure that the object doesn't fall in the middle and that uh, you know we don't have to push it around so we, we, i mean we do it in an amazing uh, uh like sophisticated way and like almost without thinking right it goes like no problem but you want to do it with the robot is difficult because you still don't know exactly how the uh, coordination between my all my fingers between each other and then your fingers how does that work um, and so that's some studies that we are doing with that uh, but also we are looking at uh, for example comparing uh, how do we manipulate an object with our dominant hand uh, the right hand if you're right-handed and with our non-dominant hand how do we apply the forces uh, with the different fingers in a different way and then we are seeing some initial results that they suggest that basically um, with the with our dominant hand, we balance the contribution of forces better. So we kind of apply the same amount of force with, with each of the finger. But with the left hand, we are not so skilled. And so maybe we do what's uh, enough. So we, you, know, you can also pick an object with just two fingers. But even if we pick with all the fingers, maybe we don't necessarily apply the same amount of force with all the fingers. And in many cases, this is not a problem. But uh, if you have a, a delicate object, if you apply the same amount of force with all the fingers, it means that overall you apply less force with each finger so you can be more delicate. And so it seems that these kind of subtle things, we do it naturally, maybe with our dominant hand and not so naturally with our non-dominant hand. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, so all these type of studies, uh, they they in improve our understanding of how we work, how, how, how our brain uh, decide those things. Uh, and also they can uh, uh, enable better robots. Mm -hmm. Quick question just popped into my head. Um, do robots have a dominant hand or would they both be considered the dominant hand? Because you're, you're kind of training both. So. Yeah, no, typically, I mean, even in, um, let's say, uh, well, many robots, they have only one hand or, <laughs> or, even, <laughs> or even just one uh, gripper, so uh, simplify hands. But even the robots that, uh, yeah, for example, the humanoid robots that have two arms and two hands, um, no, we we typically don't uh, implement uh, laterality in uh, in robot, and uh, they they don't necessarily have a dominant hand. Uh, so yeah, that's an actual uh, an interesting question whether you know again to collaborate with humans in a way that is more uh, legible, like easier to understand and to predict for human. Uh, maybe that could be an interesting aspect actually. I just thought it was interesting because. My, my 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 final year project is also on like tactile sensing and um, myoelectric prosthetics, so that's why I'm especially interested in this as well. Um, so Dr. Professor Hugh, I want to ask you one more time for your um your own research. Um, you were a former Turing Fellow, and during your time there, it looked like some of your research involved um developing adaptive learning for machines. So I wanted to ask about how that impacts the future of communication for robots. Like, how does that adaptive learning? First of all, what does that mean? And then if you could explain a little bit about how it impacts us for the future. So if I am talking to someone, any of us, if we're, we're in a conversation, when we're speaking, we monitor very carefully how the other person is responding. Mm. So if they raise their eyebrows a bit in the middle of what you're saying, that generally indicates they don't understand something about what you said. And you then need to adapt in real time to either use a different word or, you, you know, check on the understanding or do something in the conversation that allows you to shift your language use. And that's what really what adapt the, what I mean at least <laughs> about adaptive learning is that we adjust very quickly to individual differences uh, to, to, in, you know, to try and make sure that we understand each other. And I think actually we know quite a lot about how humans do that. Um, and there's lots of verbal and non-verbal tricks we use to both detect and resolve misunderstandings. And I think that's what we really need to start thinking about in artificial agents, robots, avatars, how they're going to be able to tune in to the particular people they're talking to and adjust their behaviours, adjust their speech, adjust you know what their word choices are, 
and even what the meanings of those words are and how they might shift during the conversation. Wow. And we're coming up on about 10 more minutes left, so thank you very much for that answer. But I wanted to just make sure that everybody knows if you would like to ask any questions, the Q&A section is still open, so be sure to ask any questions while we still have these wonderful experts with us. Um, I'll go back to my questions in the meantime, though. Um, so I wanted to ask a little bit more about the this AI side of technologies. So how do you think that the AI technologies are being developed and designed with a focus on addressing the human needs? So for example, this need for social communication, like speaking with our hands or just like being able to talk with different people and seeing their reactions. How do you think that AI is also playing a part in this as well? It's uh, kind of yeah. directing it to both of you, to be honest. Yeah, Pat, do you want to go ahead on the communication side or? No, you go ahead. Uh, yeah, I mean, no, no, I, I think on what Pat was saying before, because I think that's one is a crucial thing from the, but more, uh, I'll take it from the technology aspects, uh, the technology perspective. So it, it was mentioning the this adaptive learning, right? Uh, this in the, also in the robotics community, sometimes we refer to it also as a, a lifelong learning or incremental learning. So the fact that many of these AIs that we have at the, at the moment, uh, they basically learn from a bunch of data, right? You have a bunch of data, you learn your model, and then your model is used and deployed. Uh, but it's very useful to have models that can learn incrementally. They can continue to learn. Um, and I think that make that could, uh, so people also talk about developmental learning. So there are, these are some of the keywords that people talk in the AI field. Uh, and that's something that from the technology point of view, from the AI technology point of view, we are still not there yet as in fully understanding how to realize this type of learning because it has many challenges because um, basically you cannot continue to accumulate. You have sometimes to forget something, for example. So to decide, you know, what do you need to forget in order, in order to make space to new knowledge when you want to switch from, you know, one uh, thing that you think you know to another one, all right? So, so it's it's very complex, in fact, in this AI system. But this will really lead to a AI system that, uh, yeah, they could adapt and they could improve based on uh, the use that we make of them, right? So, so really, it being even more useful to people because you know you will have a certain model that is has learned how to do a certain thing, but then you start using this system and it will adapt with you. And it could be just with you, so it could be a personalized uh, kind of development, and so that you know your own tool becomes better and better over time, or just adapt to generally to group of people or community of people. Uh, and so I think that 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 is a direction that I think could be uh, it's it's fascinating, and it could bring AI even more closer to people and uh, really be useful in uh, in a lot of um, in a lot of tasks, mm -hmm. which it, which already is. I mean, I think. Many of the recent results in AI, they show us how this is changing our lives and it will keep changing our lives, uh, mostly for the positive, I believe. Uh, but yeah, so from the technology point of view, I think this aspect of developmental, lifelong lifelong learning uh, could be very important. Uh, and, and this is clearly something that uh, biological agents do all the time, right? And we, I mean, as a you know, it will learn through uh, through their uh, development, through their lifetime, as um, we evolve also through evolutions at a different time scale, right? So there are all these different ways in which we learn developmentally and uh, really over time. I'll, I'll pause you there. Um, but so just a quick question from the chat. Um, if you could give a brief highlight, I'll ask you, Dr. Lorenzo, that's a, a brief highlight of the difference between the two AI with robotics courses that we offer here at Queen Mary. Apologies to pivot. Just a quick highlight because we, we have another question after. Uh, yeah, so I think at the moment this is due to maybe change in, in, in next years, but uh, but let's say I think at the moment uh, we offer one uh, AI with robotics program in the school of X, uh, which is the computer science uh, department. Let's say the school, and then we have uh, robotics, advanced robotics. Uh, uh, or robotics and AI, which is offered by the SAMS, which is the engineering school. Uh, I would say maybe the one we offer in engineering is uh, as a little bit more robotics component, while the one that we offer in uh, School of Computer Science has a little bit more of an AI component. Uh, but other than that, they are they also there is also some overlap in between the two models. So. Uh, 
uh, I don't know. I don't think there is a huge difference, but maybe one is a little bit more AI, the other one is a bit more robotics. Uh, yeah. I wondered if it might be because you mentioned undergrad and postgrad. Ah, yeah, I'm talking about the master here, yeah. but I, be I believe they might also be referring to the master. But if not, every all the information should be on the the website as well. Yeah. Um, just quickly, I'll I'll switch over to the last question from Conwell, who said, "Um, what is your advice to to clinicians for adapting and getting familiar with these technologies, especially in underdeveloped countries, so that they don't get left behind?" I, it's not always the case that they're left behind, actually. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, sorry, the example that just came to mind when I read the question was that uh, um, you know, mobile uh, currencies on mobile phones, that took off uh, in underdeveloped countries before developed. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a really big practical question. I think we're all actually struggling to keep up at some, mm -hmm. some level. But for clinicians, I guess it's finding access to these very kind of complex and expensive sometimes healthcare applications. I think at the moment, I mean, Lorenzo might correct me, I think at the moment you would need to find the particular groups that are building those things and then either try to maybe get some online content from them or, I mean, a lot of the publications are available, you can read about them, but that's not necessarily the same as going to a lab or seeing them live or getting direct experience. That makes sense. And then just one more question from the Q&A section, which was from Tuan, who asked, um, which bachelor degree would you require to take the master's degree in AI? Would you recommend computer, computer science or a different background? I think computer science is a very good background for the um, AI degrees. Maths, um, the, yeah, there's, I mean, a lot of, anything that teaches you a lot about formal systems and formal reasoning is a good background. Thank you very much for your questions, for your answers, everyone. I really enjoyed speaking with you. Yeah, pleasure. Thank you. Very interesting discussion. <laughs> Pass over to Maria. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for attending our talk today. And I hope you found it as fascinating as I did. And big thank you to Cameron and uh, Professor Healy and Dr. Uh, Yamone. Uh, I hope you enjoyed today and I wish you all the best and enjoy the rest of today. Thanks everyone for attending. See you next time. Bye. Have a lovely day. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye now. Thank you.